Lucy, thank you everyone for coming. I feel honored to be present here for ACAP. As uh, Lucy mentioned that this, uh, this presentation is from part of our book project. That is, uh, I did field work uh, from early June to July this year in six cities uh, in mainland China. They are Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, uh, Xiamen, and Hangzhou. Uh, because I haven't do a systematic analysis on all the cases now, so here I just want to share uh, some interesting findings through three sets of cases under three topics. The first topic, or before I introduce the first topic, I want to introduce the main research question for our uh, book project. That is, our book is going to examine how countries create groups, how groups create knowledge and how globalized technologies leader and online communities accelerate the growth and exchange of knowledge at an unprecedented scale and pace. And China is one, one of the most important and special big case for our book. That's why uh, I did research fieldwork in China. So the first topic is uh, from imitation to innovation. And this topic, I introduce the first story about FIRE. FIRE is a co-partner of Hui, a casual communication company, and this company is one of the first private educational institutions focusing on the quality-oriented education in mainland China. It's, it is headquartered in Beijing. But before I introduce in detail about FIRE's background, I want to introduce how family education developed in China. Because for a long time, family education is neglected in China. For example, for my generation, our parents are busy with work, and what they focus on is that their kids can go to a top universities in China. That means the final success for education, family education. But this changed from the late 2013, because I think maybe earlier than 2013, but that is a milestone because parenting education courses came out in uh, first-tier cities and uh, some educational institutions which focus on kids' education, they found that they need to ask their parents, the kids' parents, to assist them. Uh, otherwise, their education in the private institution will not that successful because if they teach kids in one way but the parents teach the kids in another way, then there will be uh, no effect. So, and another background, I think it is China's middle class and their artists. That is what uh, be mentioned by Fair during uh, the interview because there is a rise of middle class uh, of Chinese parents. And after they found that they can, they have the ability to provide enough social resources and educational resources to their kids. They began to think of why do I can. Uh, what I can make during the process of education, how to make both parents and the kids be happy. And my kids can improve their uh, abilities in academic and at the same time improve other uh, capacities, and in, including mental health. Uh, the last background I want to introduce here is about uh, the end of one child policy. I think this policy impacts different aspects of China. And here, what I want to mention is that because since it's this one child policy issued in early 1980, which impacts several decades, that is, a lot of kids, especially those kids born in city families, they have abundant educational resources, which means that it will accumulate talent for, chi uh, for China's creative industry. Uh, and uh, we back to Fire's story. Fire was born uh, in early 1980s, and uh, she had very uh, brilliant education background. She ever studied in Wuhan University and uh, Tsinghua University, and then she received a scholarship which allowed her to study in uh, three different univers uh, different cities in Europe in European countries. And then after that, graduated Fire worked in Deloitte Beijing office, but finally she found that that is not the life she want to have. So she quit from Deloitte and then she uh, attended where as a trainer for parenting education. Uh, later on, I think maybe 
in late 2015, that is, she became the CEO of Xiaoma, the, the Quality Growth of Children uh, program. And here I, I want to introduce how the positive discipline courses in China is developed through introduce how FAIR uh, organized Xiaoma the, the, and then uh, introduced the parenting courses to parents. That is the import positive discipline course from the US and then combine series with the local cases in, in Beijing, the based on Beijing. And the, posi the positive discipline courses uh, is a program, educational program uh, developed by Dr. Jane Nielsen from the US. And the process for uh, the, the course organized by FAIR, it is that the trainers, the educators, they will study the theories imported from overseas. And then they will design syllabus how to apply the theories into practice. And during the practice, you can see from the photo, it's like a workshop. And then the members, including the educators, the parents, and the volunteers. So after practice, and uh, in the format of the plane, the educators will sit down, discuss with uh, the, the students, like the parents. And the educator, after the practice, the activities, the educators will rethink or re-examine the theories they firstly apply to the practice. So finally, they will have revised theories uh, or revised activities. So in the second photo in the slide, you can see that that is uh, on the whiteboard, we can see the PHP. It means that parent have a parent. And then after uh, they did the uh, brainstorming, if they discuss a case about one the siblings they fetch for toys, how can parents respond? And then they, after discussion, they write down some tips. Uh, and I want to, I introduce these cases because uh, it is important for us to think how the knowledge comes out because it is not from the, like a lecture educated to teach you how to educate your kids, but it is through like the activities, role playing. And which means that the parents will act as the kids during the role playing, and then they can experience what they, their kids experience when they have the real, uh, the real things at, at home. And then the knowledge comes out through practice, through uh, group discussion, and from both the educators and the participants. Uh, and I want to compare it a little bit with what I experienced in Australia, because I have attended uh, several parenting education courses in Australia. It is community-led and it is all free. Uh, but I think it's still in a traditional way, that is because there will be a lecture in so-called expert to introduce some disciplines and uh, also introduce some cases and then we'll have a, a discussion. But there's no possibility, no channels to come out new knowledge, for new knowledge to come out through the participation and the discussion. And then during my field work, I also found other cases that is in education area, which I found that they have some common features, that is the import educational model or ideas from Western countries. And then when they apply this serious disciplines to China, they will pay uh, a lot of attention on how to localize the Western series and the education models compared with local cases. Uh, so that is will respond to the topic I proposed at the beginning. That is, the first topic is from imitation to innovation. So maybe we can discuss later. That is why, whether the imitation is the road we have to pass if our destination is innovation. Uh, because I found that uh, that is not in the area of education, we have, but have some kind of relation that is in this China, there are huge number of low end manufacturing and the fit goods which harm its ability, the country's ability as a whole in innovation. And the secondly, and but in fact, from the cases I introduced, the imitation is good for innovation. But on the other side, maybe we can discuss whether it will have some negative. Uh, influence. The second question I propose here is that when we discuss cultural create groups, whether the culture is always means the global culture, especially in, in a globalized village today, 
that groups will always be local groups. That is, I think, what globalization points out. We always apply the global series uh, models into uh, combined with local cases. And uh, here's a book if you want to learn more about China's uh, development in recent years. It's a very interesting book here. Uh, and from Fair's case, I also want to introduce another interesting topic, but I will not give you some detailed introduction. That is the knowledge sharing economy, or we call the paid knowledge sharing economy. Because during our interview, Fair mentioned that she treated their products, their uh, positive parenting uh, courses, as one kind of knowledge product. And then she mentioned that because they have the a platform like online platforms for for them to touch the customers and communicate with the customers so it's easier for them to promote and sell out their product and it is quite popular in China that knowledge sharing economy and I want to do a small investigation because we have uh, a lot of postgraduate students from China now uh, if you have ever used the knowledge sharing app or ever paid for one kind of knowledge sharing product? Could you uh, raise your hand? T and also Lucy? No, I mean it depends. Do you mean a particular, those particular knowledge sharing apps? I'm going to use. Okay, so how about oh. y'all? Okay. Enemy. Yeah, yeah, I say N. And Michael and the well, Guapa. I haven't paid, but I've used. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you so use the free one, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because there are different type of there. There are free ones and there are paid ones. And the fastest development we can see from the the data that is it is already uh, in last year the industry has generated more than four point nine billion yuan that is in the output and it increased as a fast. Uh, state that is 300% year on year, and the most popular sharing platforms, including Zhihu uh, Malai FM and the uh, Liji Weike, and uh, a lot of official account in WeChat. Uh, during the interview, Fair also mentioned that every year she will pay for at least 5,000 to 8,000 to 8,000 yuan in those knowledge uh, products. So sorry, can you just explain? So is this something like a LinkedIn premium subscription where you get access to special content by special people? What, what? Yeah, quite similar, quite similar. But I think the linking is quite general because when it promoted the content to you, uh, I think it is, based on my experience, it's quite general. It's under some big titles or categories. But the knowledge sharing products in China now, they have already a lot of subtitles, subcategories for you to choose. So you, you can make it personalized. You can, yeah, and also they will promote, for example, if you uh, ever use some free content in this platform, and then it will promote a lot, a series of sub subcategories under the big topic to you, the products. So it's subscription content. Yes. Right. And then in different formats, like the audio. Yeah, program. I know. I'm just. It's just that the term knowledge sharing platform mm -hmm. is a very, very generic term yeah. because actually, you know, we basically all of digital media is a knowledge sharing platform. So yeah, I understand. It's paid. So yes. you can basically pay from Zhihu mm -hmm. to when I buy um, one piece, and then you pay uh, two dollars. Mm. You can pay it, or you can. Uh, Pay a uh, uh, monthly subscription fees, and you get access to all the content. Is so you are referring to only yeah. like the fully open like platforms uh, like uh, WeChat and mm -hmm. Google, but you are not referring to any ad hoc platforms uh, only linked to with the courses that Fire has started. I think both. both. I think that so both Fire yeah. also has developed her own apps which. You know, offers an open platform for the parents attending course. Yeah, I think, uh, sorry, I, I didn't understand your second question, but for the first question, I think they're both included. That is, I think the, maybe we can discuss 
uh, later. That is because I found that in LinkedIn, when they promote some courses to you, it's based on like improve your ability in career seeking, something like that. But here it's based on different cover kind of different areas. For example, if you like poet poem, then it will have some poem courses. If you like music, it will like classic music. It will be courses introducing classic. Yeah, classic. So songs. is it online learning? Is that what it? Is? Yeah, online learning. So it's online learning and subscription content. Is that what? Yeah. Because I think that the term knowledge sharing platforms will have to come up with a maybe a, a clearer term. Yeah. So maybe here the knowledge sharing here I think maybe comes from it's more. Uh, it's so Zhihu Zhihu maybe can be uh, as a classic. Uh, representative of not sharing because when people propose questions, everyone, every member of Zhihu can answer, have an answer. But why I also included some like online learning into the knowledge sharing economy because they they are quite interactive. So it's just a general uh, description for. But in I here I include everything under the title that is the not sharing. Platform, okay. including the online learning, including the sharing, yeah, like the QA and and like the QR, but it's more prof professional, including but not limited to the mm. QR. Okay, I will go on. And uh, uh, here I I pay, I I found that with the rise of the knowledge sharing economy and uh, and industry. There are slow down in traditional publishing, education, media, and other related sectors. I read a report recently that is they found that a lot of qualified professionals they trans they change their job from the traditional publishing, education to knowledge sharing uh, company because they has a shorter monetization process and huge potential for growth. And then here comes my uh, second topic for this presentation and uh, I will introduce a set of cases. Sorry, uh, can you just go back one? Oh, sorry. So when you're saying traditional publishers are moving into being online knowledge sharing companies, does mm -hmm. that mean that traditional publishers are looking at like online exactly. distribution and business models? Is, or exactly. is there something more formal in the change that you're talking about? Um, I think uh, I think because based on my just based on my field work, I found that uh, because I in, uh, I interviewed uh, two editors who work in the traditional population focused on children's population, and they mentioned that a lot of their colleagues they change their job from the publisher company to like knowledge sharing online company the, those ones big online publishing based companies. Okay. Yeah. And it's not quite the same thing, it's not publishers changing, mm -hmm. it's people leaving publishers and getting into it. And getting into and So it's not occupational So magazines are over, but it's so... It's not occupational change, not administration. change. Thank you, John. <laughs> okay, so the second topic is from self-employment to innovative enterprise. And, the third, and this one, this photo is for my first case, that is... Uh, Party products designed by Bobby and her company. And Bobby is a graphic designer. She's she's quite young. She's born in 1989, and she got her uh, master degree in design from UK. Uh, firstly, uh, in from 2013, she joined after she graduated. She joined a, a Taobao shop, providing the customer party products. And what, what what different from other Taobao shop is that they design that because they are designer. So she and her team design all the products they sell. And the, the team is consisted of three female graphic designers, and their workplace is at home. They communicate through like mobile phone and social media. And Bobby's responsibilities when he when she, when they work as the self employment model, they. She is responsible for operation, promotion, and she even works as a cashier. And the, pro and the, the pro promotion channel and approaches for uh, Bobby's Taobao shop changed during these several years. 
I listed uh, uh, this topic here because from this story, you can see that the social media platform, the popularity of this platform changed dramatically in China in recent five or say 10 years. Because earlier, uh, Bobby promoted their products through Xinlan Blog, Taobao, and Zhihu. And uh, because their core customers are young, uh, are young mom or white collars, and the white collars are also the core customer of Xinlan Blog. But since the uh, yeah, since the WeChat comes out, I think from 20, uh, from 2014, Xinlan Blog drops and the popularity drops. And then right now they use WeChat moments and the Bilibili to promote their products to young customers. And the Bilibili I need to introduce uh, a little bit here, that is it is a video sharing website themed around animation, comic, and the game based in China. When I, when I was teaching in Xiao Tong and my student handing a course paper stabbed Bilibili, I said, oh, what's this? What's this Bilibili? But finally I found out it's quite popular among young people. So it has changed dramatically in recent years. And uh, as what I introduced earlier, I, I focus on their producing process because I want to see how the knowledge will be, how the culture creates knowledge and how the knowledge, uh, how the culture creates groups and uh, how, how the, what is the system for uh, creating knowledge within their team? And I found out that they design their products based on customers' requirements and the designers' ideas. And that is can ban both imitation and innovation. Because some customer will propose that, oh, for example, I like the proper chow. Could you please provide some uh, pet products uh, based on proper chow? Uh, but some people may only think that oh, I just want a uh, uh, like quite sweet party for my daughter, and could you please just think of some creative uh, things design, designing for my daughter's party? Then it is, they, they will give space uh, for the designer to create innovation. And then after they have uh, the, uh, the draft idea, the chief designer, because there are three designers, Totally, we have made a customized version manuscripts and then turn them into the printable files. Uh, after that, the uh, casual employee, the crafter, will print the models and uh, uh, do the products through uh, handmade. The, product, the all the products are handmade. But the challenges for all this self employment uh, small business it is that. It is hard for them to protest their copyright because during the interview, Bobby mentioned that it is frequently they found out a lot of other Taobao shops or even some companies they will copy their designing and in a very quick time after they issue their products in their Taobao store. But what they can do it is just make their design manuscripts finer and more complex. That is all. Should that oh what they made is ugly compare with our original one, but it's what the only thing they can do now. Uh, here I want to introduce a, a failed attempt that is I interviewed a girl who want to build up a startup in gaming in Shanghai with her uh, with her partners. That is Xiao Liang's story. And Liang was born in 1992. Why I mentioned uh, the interview's age here? Because uh, later on, I want to introduce that in today's China, a lot of young people that are full of creative, creative spirit, and then they, I think they will become the main group of people who are do some innovation uh, enterprises. Uh, and then Liang, she, she, she after she uh, worked in. Three, yeah, three different gaming startups in Shanghai. She decided to uh, set up a startup by himself, by herself. And uh, their goal is to develop a new games console, and uh, they hope to secure angel investment. The their ultimate goal is to become a unicorn, which means that they will not copy any successful uh, models, but they want to create a unduplicated uh, model.
by themselves. And the background is that uh, I think from the early two, yeah, year 2000, Chinese government banned the gaming consoles. But after 15 years, uh, they released the ban, they ended the ban on gaming consoles. So they'll, they, their startup company will focus on uh, console gaming. And the India chain different from what is I mentioned earlier about Bobby. Like because Bobby, that there are three, the three uh, designers, they don't have the distinct responsibilities. They just uh, take the responsibility to do designing, take turns. But for Liang's startup, when they build, when she build up uh, her team, she have very clear. Uh, distribution of the tasks. For example, Liang as CEO, she will be uh, taking responsibility for distribution and marketing. And Denise, uh, a Malaysian girl who has worked in a Japanese company for over 10 years, and she will be responsible for overseas marketing. And Xiaogu, uh, a, a boy going born in Shanghai, she will be responsible, he will be responsible for research and the development on gaming products. And the, the, the team's average uh, age are just uh, 32, and they have shared values and common interests in games. That is quite similar to Bobby's team, because during the interview, Bobby also mentioned that we straight become friends because we have common interest. Bobby even found one of their uh, team members from, from Zhuhu, from the social media. At that time, the girl was studying designing in San Francisco, and after uh, seeing several products, designing products of that girl, Bobby including to invite her to join her team. So I want to make a summary here to base on earlier cases because I found that in today's China the entrepreneurs background uh, they have some common uh, features for example in the age they are quite young they are born in 1980s and the 1990s and related to what I mentioned that they are the generation of the one child after the one child policy issue so especially those uh, kids who were born in cities first year or First year or second tier cities, they have abundant uh, education resources, and then most of them have the overseas education experience, like Xiaoliang, like uh, Bobby, and also Fire. Uh, they set up their own business or enterprises after leaving large sized companies because this social transformation in China is no longer the Alan Rice Bowl, uh, which is be if you have. In earlier days, if you have an iron rice bowl, then every people will envy you. But today, it's out of date, especially for young people. They want to get rid of the restrictions from the, like we call it, system from down way, from Tizhi. That is, I also think that it can be related to reflexive, sorry for the tapping arrow, reflexive project of the self, which from Giddens, because when Giddens described the uh, uh, transformation from traditional society to modern society should find that in modern society the people they are willing to look for autonomy and they want to control this themselves and that is what I found that it is quite obvious in today's young generation in China they want to get into of their own life and uh, the third common thing is that they all organize a team which share the common values and interests. And I think it will can uh, be one kind of respond to what Professor Hartley and the Professor Paul's proposed that culture will create groups and the groups produce knowledge. If you don't have to share values or you share similar uh, cultural uh, yeah, values or interests, then it is harder for you to get together to do something uh, innovative and then they all, all live in first tier cities in China. Due to the time limitation, I, I can't introduce more about the, the huge gap between cities, between urban area and the rural area 
in today's channel now. But I just want to remind you that it's the things, the questions, the situations is quite different in China between rural area and the urban area. So what I introduce, what my uh, here, all my cases come from cities. Okay, the last topic that is I want to introduce a little bit about the policy, government, social organization, and the, their interaction with innovation. Uh, here, I want to analyze the social context for the growth of creativity and the new knowledge. Today, China is developing fast of the internet-based economy. We have already have the internet blueprint and uh, from the central government to the local government, uh, they both promote the entrepreneurship and then they have different kinds of policies. But as far as I know, uh, within Shanghai, even because Shanghai is a super city and uh, it has different regions and a different region has different policy for promote like building up startups or entre entrepreneurship. And then China's, uh, to, to most extent, China's cultural industry is built up uh, through the government land. So I uh, made a title here as government-led cultural industries. And we already have a Made in China 2025 plan. So under this background, this social background, we can find that a lot of entrepreneur or uh, enterprises, they try to cooperate uh, with the government to earn more resources to support their uh, own business. For example, uh, after government promote the government procurement for public service, uh, Wang Yong set up the Lao Niu workshops after he running a senior-oriented website for 10 years because uh, the government found that there are a lot of areas they have no energy or resources to, to cover, so they want to uh, employ or want to cooperate with some social organizations to do some uh, creative things in different areas, especially, for example, looking for the demand the elderly. And the Lao Liu uh, workshop, they undertook the project issued by the Shanghai local government. It's just how things turn into English. I just think the demented elderly is an unfortunate translation. Sorry. <laughs> I think you might want to say elderly people living with dementia or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think demented elderly, it's like something out of a gothic horror story. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, so they carry on for the elderly in this uh, demented situation. With <laughs> 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 dementia. Oh, with yeah. dementia. Okay, and uh, also I will introduce uh, the no, second no. case. It's just an old age Karen. Oh, yes, okay. it's fine. No, it's just with dementia. It's because demented yes. has been used as an insulting <laughs> term for a long time. <laughs> That's the problem. So you can have dementia, but if I say you're demented, mm -hmm. then it's an insult. And so, so that's the difficulty by saying demented elderly. It's like a very insulting. Yes. No, the tension is quite under. I would use old age here. But not but everyone different. who's old has dementia. That one is too general. Yeah. Or the... <laughs> <laughs> old people have different. No, we have dementia. It's clinic. Senility. Um, yeah. Senile dementia. Senior. Yeah. Yeah,当你说老年痴呆的时候，它一定是一个临床的诊断。但实际上呢，很多人并不是真的有老年痴呆症，它只是说年纪老了糊涂了。其实你就中国人，你说dementia yeah. is like actually a sort of a clinical diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. In China, these people would go for that. You say, oh, they're just being a uh, so old old age carrying this. It's the same as just beginning to reach that. So we're really happy. <laughs> well, the other thing is we use the term frail elderly. 
So it means people who are fragile and older. Is a very but but in, but I think it is for the elderly with dementia because that is one specified so area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then you just have to say with dementia. Yeah, with dementia. So yeah. for the poor <laughs> translation. <laughs> okay, it's technically correct. It's just that. Right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so for the second case, that is uh. It's called Le Mille, a children reading camp. And uh, before I interview uh, the founder of Le Mille and the, my friends, the contact person told me that it's quite a hand-end uh, reading camp because the parents need to pay 800 yuan for each course. But after I entered, entered uh, yeah, after I visited Le Mille, I found that it's quite similar to the, the right town in library now for kids, for toddlers here. But yet they also they all also borrow those uh, Western models and uh, in, in apply it to Chinese feed. But what I want to mention here is that Le Mi Le, they send a contract with government. So although one of their main uh, activities do the uh, children reading camp, but another part of their work, and I think maybe the best way for them to gain resources, that is the training daycare center, carers, and the primary school teachers for government, for Beijing government. Uh, so, it, this is the uh, positive things uh, I mentioned earlier, that is how government support the innovation, that is the entrepreneurship, but we can also see the limitation from government because I, uh, I mentioned earlier, I didn't finish the uh, analysis on my cases. So here I just uh, pick up something, some sporadic things for my uh, interview. That is, here I, uh, I mentioned limitation and at the same time I introduced the strategies how people to manage the uh, sensitivities. Like uh, they will set up, because they have a very restrict policy for set up for the private power, private company to set up a school, an education institution. So a, a lot of all these educational institutions now, they set up as a cultural communication company or educational consultant company rather than education or training institutions. That is what they did now. Like what I mentioned earlier, there's parenting education and uh, learning love. Yeah, they are. They are all casual communication company. Uh, the second strategy is that it is related to gaming. That is what introduced by uh, by Xiaoyang. That is, they will delete or replace sensitive content. The case one is that uh, in the video game player unknowns <coughs> background, and uh, because they need to go through the uh, the track by some. Uh, government sectors in China and they think that no because you have a lot of blood bees uh, everywhere in some things so you, it is will not be passed and what they did is they changed the color of the blood from from yeah. red to green that's what they did yeah and then they passed the, the examination and then the Second case that is the, because I also visited Beijing, you can catch the media organization. They do the publication about children's books. And the, and the actor mentioned that one day I uh, compare a book introduced the history of some uh, great, great his, historic places in China, like the Great War, they found quite difficult because when they want to introduce the history of the Great War in Beijing, they, they cannot clearly, ex explicitly to introduce that is uh, the pair, the Asian pair, the build up the Great War for invade the, the invasion from like the other the ethnicities. That is, it will impact the harmony, harmony here but in today's China, that is what they think of. And uh, all the third strategy may be waiting for the change of the policies. As I mentioned earlier, in Xiaoliang's case, uh, they want to set up a startup on a video game controller because China is finally 
uh, scratching the, the ban on this kind of game. And the social context that is uh, will promote the growth of creativity and new, no new knowledge. Uh, I summarized several uh, points here. I think the first is the model's influence, like the BAT, that is the uh, super high technological internet companies or e-commerce company like the Alibaba, Baidu, and the Tencent. And also, they will be China has has been experienced has experienced the investment boom or unicorn fever. It takes an average of four years for startup in China to reach unicorn status, and it is quite fast speed. And the third is that we have uh, a large uh, a large amount of communication tools and the social net social networking platforms like Singlon Blog, QQ, and WeChat, which promote the the communication between the enterprise, uh, the entrepreneurs, the customers, and the customers, and save the time and also their cost. Uh, the two main age groups of creative professionals are found that the people, the young people who are born after 1990s, uh, because they have a lot of dreams, they are they are don't scared of the risks, and all the people in their late 30s or early 40s because they want to break through their professional bottleneck and they have already accumulated uh, abundant social resources. Uh, what's the time now? Maybe I need to... 7 to 1. 7, seven to one. Yeah. So maybe I can I skip this one and then we'll jump to the discussion. That is, I want to discuss what are the elements contribute to Chinese creative innovation and the network culture based on the cases I introduced here. I'm um, thinking maybe the increase of social wealth, that is people pay more attention uh, to like the mental development and the free development of people's cap capabilities. And also I think the increase of social risks. Uh, and then the rise of middle class, the uh, new middle class, they be self-reflective, they pay attention to life or quality, the quality of education on their kids and the social transformation, for example, break up the iron rice bowl and the global high uh, global high level or high quality education resources coming into China. That is based on the cases I introduced earlier. I found that because China is quite uh, open to the whole world now and for the University students, both the university students and all the academic staff, they have more and more chances to go out to receive overseas uh, like study program, they exchange, or maybe they have to, to do their uh, master's degree or attend the PhD program. And then I think the uh, global high level education resources also contribute to today's China's innovation process. And there are recent studies focusing on creative industry in China. So if you want to learn more about uh, what happened to Chinese creative industries, you can refer to the books because my favorite work is is there. Uh, the findings is quite is quite uh, preliminary right now. And thank you for listening and I welcome your questions.